shining down on the valley. Hope to be a flyfish to the day that I die. Spring has thawed out the long bitter winter. The water is clear and the skies are blue. I'm standing in the middle of the Beaver Kill River. Might even catch and release one or two. happening to your national forest. On the slopes above Overwich Creek, in the headwaters of the Bitterroot River in western Montana, the trees were cut down, then the mountainsides collapsed. How did this happen? Was it the road building? Was it the clear cutting? Was it the deliberately set fires? Who did this? Was it the Forest Service? Was this done with your tax dollars? We met with the Bitterroot National Forest Supervisor, Steve Kelly. He declined a video interview, but did give us the official Forest Service incident summary, stating, an intense rainstorm on June 25th, 1992 caused severe erosion in the channels of four tributaries of Overwich Creek, from the headwaters located in the Overwich Two Burn to the confluence with Overwich Creek. Sediment from the tributaries flowed directly into Overwich Creek and through Painted Rocks Reservoir into the West Fork of the Bitterroot River. Preliminary findings indicate that a large percentage of the fish community in the lower five miles of Overwich Creek may have been destroyed. According to forest watershed and soil specialists, clear cuts and roads did not cause the Overwich incident or contribute significantly to the eroded material. This is not a natural disaster. The Forest Service made a series of high-risk management decisions that led to this catastrophe. First, they built roads into this steep roadless area to get up into some of the last untouched forest for the purpose of cutting down the trees. Then they took the risk of clear-cutting the trees on these steep slopes right down to streamside. 
Then, when they burned the logging slash during hot, dry weather, wildfires escaped on two separate occasions. With 1,800 acres of burned forest, clear cuts to streamside, and roads dicing through steep drainages, the land had been put in a precarious situation. There's 375,000 miles of roads on the national forest in the United States. That makes the Forest Service the number one road building agency in the world. That's enough roads to go around the circumference of the earth 15 times. It's one and a half times to the moon and back. It's eight and a half times the interstate highway system. These burns that we see today are a result of the Forest Service. They were burning slash and clear cuts and it got out of control. Until prompted, they were not mentioning the cause of the fire. If a member of the public were to start a brush fire in their backyard and it got onto national forest land, they would get a bill to pay for the firefighting and rehabilitation of the land. In this case, the taxpayer foots the bill. It takes at least 10,000 years to build up soil that can sustain a forest. So soil is not a renewable resource. 10,000 years of evolution of soil is heading downhill along with boulders three feet across and trees 100 feet long. Suspended in the water, the clay, silt, and sand kept moving, hit the creek, and killed the fish. 100 miles downstream, the silt has reached Missoula. From the Clark Fork to the Columbia, it will reach the Pacific Ocean. The Forest Service has broken the law here. The National Forest Management Act mandates that there are not any practices permitted on the national forest that change the water temperature, the chemical composition, the flow, the sediment load, or fish habitat. On every one of those points, the law has been broken. Congressionally approved Forest Service mismanagement killed this area. And they continue doing this. This is not old forestry. This is 1980s, 1990s style forestry. I don't know if this is just the new forestry or the new and improved forestry, but it's really the same old forestry. When the Forest Service punches roads like this into previously wild areas, they're no longer available for wilderness designation. Is that why the Forest Service is in such a road-building frenzy? Suffering an eight-year drought here in Montana, a one-inch rainstorm could have been a blessing, but it had a detrimental impact. It doesn't take a scientist to recognize that water will follow the path of least resistance. We are right in the middle of the catastrophe. There are eroded drainages on both sides of this, and yet this drainage is still intact. That's because it hasn't been under Forest Service management. This is indicative of what it would have been like with this one-inch rainstorm on a natural forest. There would not have been a catastrophe. What we see here today is horrifying to people. It seems hopeless, and folks feel helpless. But there is a wonderful alternative. It's called the Northern Rockies Ecosystem Protection Act. It's a bill proposed by the Alliance for the Wild Rockies, awaiting introduction in Congress by someone with vision and courage. It's a bioregional approach to ecosystem management, protection, and restoration of wild lands. It encompasses the remaining roadless areas in the northern Rockies of Wyoming, Idaho, Montana, and adjacent parts of Oregon and Washington. This bill protects the region's remaining big wilderness complexes as well as undeveloped corridors between them for migrating wildlife. Wildlife and their habitat don't know state political boundaries.
over which is not an isolated situation. The Forest Service is road building, clear cutting, and burning on every forest in the United States. When will this happen in your backyard? They sawed the right away for the road, and then they came in and they sawed the trees out of the clear cut. And then when the fire escaped, they sawed the fire lines, and then came the sawing for the fire rehabilitation. Now they come in with saws to attempt to patch up the catastrophe. So basically, that's the Forest Service's main tool, the chainsaw. It seems to be their answer to all the needs of the forest. And they're still out here sawing. The wild trout fisheries of Montana are world class. Uh, the habitat that supports that world class fishery is on uh, the national forests and the public lands for the most part. The same habitat that supports that, kind of, that fishery, that wild trout fishery, is also the habitat that supports uh, elk, that provides security and cover for elk, uh, that provides security and cover for uh, wide-ranging, low-density species such as uh, lynx and fisher, wolverine, wolf, grizzly, black bear, uh, mountain lion uh, is also a uh, threat in the logging and the road building that's going on. Um, the reason that all much of it is being destroyed is, is because of political pressure from politicians, from some of the politicians in the administration, uh, some politicians in, the, in Congress, and also uh, through actions of people who hold uh, the real power in the Forest Service. Uh, I'm speaking of the chief, of some of the regional foresters, of the chiefs, some of the chief staff. Uh, for the most part, uh, the people on the forest and the ranger districts don't hold the real power in the agency. But uh, these people that I mentioned are are breaking the laws that govern the administration of the national forest. And they're they're uh, breaking the regulations and in, in many cases the forest plan standards through political pressure and, and uh, coercion and that kind of thing. Uh, we all can do something about it. We can and should uh, write to our congressional delegations and ask that an independent group of scientists be appointed uh, to make a special investigation of, of the administration of, of the National Forest in, in the Northern Rockies. Uh, you can also support a, a bill that is, hasn't been introduced yet, it's in writing, that would protect all the remaining uh, roadless lands. I believe that bill is called the uh, Northern Rockies Ecosystem Protection Act. Um, it's up to all of us. As Americans, we have a right and an obligation, actually a duty, to protect the natural resources of this nation uh, from, from destruction. On September 9, 1992, Representative Peter Kostmeyer introduced the Northern Rockies Ecosystem Protection Act before the U.S. House of Representatives. Contact your representatives and support this visionary legislation. For more information on the bill, contact the Alliance for the Wild Rockies.
city has the world's largest unfiltered water supply. Right now, the natural gas industry wants to drill in our watersheds. The process is called hydraulic fracturing. It uses over 900 chemicals injected under the ground, combined with explosives that cause many earthquakes to extract the gas. But the process hasn't been proven safe. Watersheds across the nation have been contaminated with plastics, carcinogens, mutagens, and endocrine disrupting chemicals, and with explosive natural gas. Whoa. This cannot be allowed to happen here. Join Scott Stringer, Manhattan Borough President's Kill the Drill campaign. Because we can't drink natural gas. And because there's no New York without New York water. And that to me is the most alarming environmental news I've heard in a long time. And makes this the number one environmental crisis that we face in the city. A message from Scott Stringer, Manhattan Borough President and WaterUnderAttack.com. Folks, welcome to today's show. Today's show is going to is already featured a clip called over which creek gamble it's about a stream out west uh, it took place back in the early 90s i believe and what happened was uh the, the national forest service clear was clear cutting steep uh areas in the in the mountains out west and it caused massive erosion because the the trees could not so the, the ground could not hold the soil anymore because there was lack of vegetation and this created many fish kills and problems, dams were filled up, catch basins were wiped out, all kinds of problems. And this was all because of the National Forest Service road building programs that they have out west where the taxpayer puts the bill for logging companies. Imagine that. And we don't get any money for it because it's actually at a loss. Even grazing out west is at a loss. And even here at the Finger Lakes National Forest, we lose money on the grazing programs they have there. So it's time for that to stop. We're overtaxed. If you're going to charge money on our properties, uh, at least get us the money we're owed uh, for that National Forest Service land and uh, National Park land. Now I'm going to feature a video called Quick Release. This is uh, from Joan Wolfe, and she's going to show you how to release a trout properly. Hello, I'm Joan Wolfe. I'd like to invite you to take a few minutes to learn how to give the trout you release their best chance of survival. John and Dusty were just about to call it a day. I got one. They're glad they didn't. Get ready now. Here it comes. Get him, Dad. That's some fish, Dusty. Indeed it was. You think he's been caught before? Could be. We released a few this morning. If this trout could only talk, it might tell the boy it had been caught not once, but two other times. And though the anglers who caught the fish released it for different reasons, they all had something in common. They knew how to help the fish survive its release. And it all started three years ago. Ah, quite another little one. The trout's first encounter with a hook could have been the most dangerous of all. Is that your bait or the fish? Very funny, mister. I haven't caught a trout yet. Most trout easily survive being lightly hooked in the mouth, but this was more serious because the fish was caught by all three of the treble's hooks. A little hungry today, weren't we? Some people might have jerked the undersized fish around, handled it roughly, and kept it out of the water a fatal period of time. But this anger was different. She kept the fish in the water as much as she could, and because her lures had hooks with small barbs, it was easier for her to back out each hook point. Here you go, little guy. Hope to see you again next year. I think we should release him. Are you sure? There aren't many around like this one. Do you think he'll live? I think he has a good chance of living. You brought him in quickly, and it's only lightly hooked. 
This fish knew all about being hooked deeply. Two years ago, it had its second bout with a hook. If the fish had been caught in the feeder creek just upstream, it would have been that night's dinner. Don't tell me you're not big enough. But this section of the river had a 12-inch size limit. You wouldn't want to stretch a half inch, would you? I guess not. Luckily for the trout, the man valued the fish's welfare more than a five-cent hook. Well, now why'd you go and swallow that all the way? As soon as the fisherman saw the fish had swallowed the hook, he knew what he had to do. If he tried removing the hook, the fish would almost certainly die. He also knew that two out of three deeply hooked fish will survive if the line is cut. So without a tug, he simply snipped the line next to the trout's mouth. Done everything I can for you, buddy. And let nature take its course. Hope you make it. And so the trout... Grab him right through the net. Hold him gently, but solidly. Right. That will confuse him. So he won't struggle so hard. This trout had survived two close calls with anglers and many more against natural predators. And now it was lucky once more. Today, the fish wasn't too small. It was just in good company. You too should consider proper release. Practice these CPR tips so the trout you return to the water will have their best chance of surviving. Rule one is don't play fish to the point of exhaustion. Trout need all of their energy reserves to survive the stress of being caught. Second, use a landing net, preferably one with a knotless cotton mesh, even on a small trout. Think of your net as a third hand. It will help you control the fish and shorten the time needed for handling. Third, firmly grasp the fish across the back, just behind the head, avoiding the gills. This is a solid area on a trout. Then turn the fish upside down. Fish in this position become disoriented and struggle less, allowing you to remove your hook quickly and safely. Fourth, don't even try removing swallowed or deeply embedded hooks. Instead, quickly size up how you've hooked your fish and act accordingly. Without pulling on the line any harder than you have to, snip the line at the mouth and let the fish go. And finally, keep fish in the water as much as possible. One recent study has found that the longer trout are kept out of the water, the more they are likely to die from damage to their fragile gills. Let's see, the highlight of this morning of fishing was when you released that big fish. I'll say. I guess you could say that I recycled it, kind of like this can. As Lee Wolf once said, a good game fish is too valuable to be caught only once. And the fish you release is your gift to another angler, as it may have been another angler's similar gift to you. This can only happen if we release fish in the safest way. Thanks for watching, and good fishing. Sound of music. <laughs> <laughs>